Okay, it's a, it's a great honor to introduce to you Jan Goldstein, the Norman and Edna Freeling Professor of History at the University of Chicago. Uh, I encourage you to read the biography. You know, it is really, it's a, it's a wonderful testament uh, to your life and to your scholarship and to your contributions. Uh, Jan was born in the Bronx, uh, did her undergraduate degree at what was then Radcliffe, went on to pursue a PhD at Columbia. She has been a recipient of the Guggenheim and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. If I had to use one word to describe her scholarship, the word would be capacious. She's an intellectual historian who delves deeply into the historical context of ideas. She looks at what, are the, what is the economic context, what is the political context, the social context, the cultural context. She certainly signaled her arrival in the historical profession with her book that was published in 1987 that is still in print. How many people can say that? And the book is called Console and Classify, the French Psychiatric Profession in 19th Century. The second book is called The Post-Revolutionary Self, Politics and Psyche in France, 1750 to 1830, which I think really establishes her as a really an important interlocutor, particularly as a historian uh, for the works of Michel Foucault. And her most recent book is called Hysteria Complicated by Ecstasy, The Case of Nanette Leroux. Now, she's also been the co-editor of the Journal of Modern History. And in 2005, published in Modern Intellectual History, uh, as a labor historian, I really can't wait to read this article. It's called Of Marx and Marxmanship, Reflections on the Ling Linguistic Instruction of Class in Recent Historical Scholarship. She's really been at the forefront in terms of linking what we do as historians uh, with our colleagues uh, in the sciences. Look, I read a review recently of E.O. Wilson's The Meaning of Human Existence, and I think I want to take a quote from that review because it really, to me, encapsulates Jan Goldstein's scholarship. It is artists and storytellers, not scientists, who can potentially reconcile the viewpoints of the priest with those of the etymologist, who can expose the shortcomings in both perspectives and complicate deterministic philosophies, be they conveyed in the jargon of biology or in the rhetoric of, of scripture. In terms of talking about her impact on changing conceptions of the self, I think Jan Goldstein, uh, as a historian, has no equal. And so it's a great pleasure to introduce you to you my colleague, Professor Jan Goldstein. Thank you, Vicki, and thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, the name of the talk is Toward an Empirical History of Moral Thinking, the Case of Racial Theory in Mid-19th Century France. News commentators and pundits routinely tell us that the true significance of some current event must await the verdict of history. Yet, as pleased as we are to have our discipline mentioned in the media, professional historians cannot help but find that term dubious. We know that the so-called verdict of history is not something uttered plainly or in the singular by an objective process, but is generally issued in the plural by individual historians offering disparate accounts. Paul Ricoeur's metaphor of events leaving their mark on time and of human deeds as open work, calling for fresh interpretations to plumb their meaning, suggests a more congenial job description for the historian than that of the judge whose ruling brings closure. It assumes that the marks discerned by historians in the documentary record always remain amenable to interpretive practices and that more than one interpretation has plausibility. Still, in certain areas, the collectivity of historians does seem to speak with a single voice, producing something like the clarity of a judicial verdict. One of those areas is the rise of racial theory, 
a process that began in 19th century Western Europe and reached its apogee during the Second World War. This discursive trend, historians concur, turned out to be disastrous. It aided genocidal projects, making them thinkable and enlisting support for them, even if it didn't single-handedly cause them. Ironically, such consensus produces methodological problems of its own. What stance is the historian to take toward the early participants in this trend? I'm not thinking here of those who engaged in a rabble-rousing, hate-mongering racial politics, but of those who pursued a scholarly investigation of race along lines that they believed scientific. They didn't attempt to apply their doctrines and often seem to have lacked the imagination or motivation even to picture what such an application might entail. Yet knowing how things turned out, we are tempted to write their history as if delivering a verdict from the lofty heights of our retrospective knowledge. We become self-righteous owls of Minerva, taking flight at dusk. In my talk this evening, I'd like to use some material from my current research to ponder this delicate problem of the historian's moral stance when investigating an area in which the so-called verdict of history is loud and clear. I'd like to propose that between the extremes of a blanket condemnation of all the contributors to an intellectual trend that had reprehensible consequences, and a hands-off stance maintaining that moral criteria shift over time and shouldn't concern us per se as historians, there is a specifically historical level of analysis that I call the empirical history of moral thinking. Avoiding both blame and exoneration, this form of inquiry would attempt to specify in empirical terms the parameters of moral judgment on certain topics at certain historical moments. To paraphrase Didier Fassin, who I recently learned has called for a similar program in the discipline of anthropology, this approach would not ask historians to become moralists, but rather to study morals as we study politics, institutions, or social groups. Fassin usefully distinguishes between moral discourse itself and a critical analysis of a moral topic. The first, he says, evaluates, judges, and simplifies on the basis of prior principles, while the second proposes, after careful examination, a possible intelligibility for a moral phenomenon and thereby captures its complexity. My case study in this experiment in the empirical history of moral thinking is French intellectuals' engagement with race in the mid-19th century. I begin in 1847 and make a foray into the 1880s, but I focus on the roughly two decades following the dramatic failure of the revolution of 1848 to move France in a progressive direction. By the 1850s, French writers began to testify to an intellectual sea change, a felt imperative to introduce racial categories into reflections on politics and society. In a private letter, for example, Alexis de Tocqueville saw as a sign of the times that the highly promising son of a prominent liberal intellectual had chosen to make his literary debut with, of all things, a conspicuously placed review of recent scholarship about the human races. Another commentator, faced with two massive works of the early 1850s, Autour de Gobineau's essay on the inequality of the human races and Ernest Renan's general history of the Semitic languages, 
cast them as representatives of an utterly new and strange genre, the philosophy of history that adopted race as its causal principle. Let's turn for a moment to these latter two books to take a sounding of the social convention of intellectuals of the day with respect to racial theory. Gobineau's essay, 1853, had a notorious career decades after its publication, first winning the admiration of Richard Wagner, then aiding the bellicose pan-Germanism of the Second Reich before 1914, and finally integrated into Nazi ideology. It would certainly qualify as racist by today's standards, that is, postulating a permanent biological hierarchy of human races based on supposedly hereditary traits said to justify the placement of their members in correspondingly hierarchized social roles. Renan's General History, 1855, marshaled as evidence by the rabid anti-Semite Edward Drummond in his book-length screed of 1886, Jewish France, might qualify as racist as well, though it was, as we'll see, considerably more ambiguous. These tomes attracted moral criticism in France immediately upon publication. But even for their harshest critics, the views expressed by Gobineau and Renan were not regarded as beyond the pale nor as grounds for exclusion from polite intellectual company, not seen as they are today as entailing a fundamental moral flaw. Thus Tocqueville, Gobineau's patron, subjected the younger man to an impassioned moral rebuke in 1855 when he wrote to acknowledge the copy of the essay he received hot off the press from its eager author. In letters to close friends, he went further, calling the essay a, quote, fat book designed to prove that all the events of this world can be explained by racial difference and likening it to the philosophy of the director of a stud farm. But he ultimately compartmentalized his strong negative reaction, neither speaking out against the book publicly nor cutting his effective ties with the author, even supporting Gobineau's candidacy for the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences. At that same academy, Adolf Frank, the first Jewish philosophy professor in a French university, revealed a similar compartmentalization when reporting on Renan's newly published general history. He presented a strong moral critique of Renan's central argument and one structurally similar to Tocqueville's private censure of Gobineau. But he concluded by calling the morally troubling parts of the book inessential to the whole and praising Renan's erudite contribution as original and captivating to read. In the 1860s, Franck entered into correspondence with Gobineau after receiving an off-print from him. A gratified Gobineau noted the overlap in their scholarly views, but added tellingly, in terms of the norms of compartmentalization I've been tracing, but on the subject of the races, we'll quarrel, won't we? So how then can we as historians characterize the moral field in which mid 19th century French intellectuals acting as theorists or critics made pronouncements about race? By moral field, I mean the set of normatively charged considerations derived from diverse sources and ambient rather than codified that seemed to have guided them and that they explicitly cited. After studying a select group from this vantage point, including Gobineau, Tocqueville, Renan, and the members of the Paris Ethnological Society, 
I've tentatively concluded that the moral field in question was structured by four such considerations, which constituted lines of force within it. The moral field wasn't static. Its lines of force galvanized intellectuals to varying degrees, and moreover, interacted dynamically with one another in ways that affected their ultimate impact. Just one of my cast of characters engaged with all four considerations, and one engaged only with one. None of the considerations either logically entailed or excluded any of the others, allowing intellectuals to combine them as they saw fit. The first such consideration was the ethos of science, a set of implicit moral norms that was at this date moving toward the ideal of objectivity. It was likewise moving toward broad acceptance of a Comtean positivist ideal in which scientists, relinquishing claims to absolute knowledge, rested content with detecting the lawful regularities among observable phenomena. In this context, we're interested in the new human sciences, in particular anthropology and philology, that model themselves on the natural sciences. The second consideration concerned the practical impact of theorizing about race. Was one morally obliged to consider the probable consequences of one's pronouncements? The third consideration grew out of the traditional discourse of matter and spirit as the two components of human nature. In this discourse, materialism, or the reduction of the human to the material component, was equated with fatalism and condemned for its denial of the freedom of the human will. Victor Cousin's philosophy had revitalized this generically Christian doctrine for 19th century French consumption. The fourth consideration was the widely accepted postulate of the equality of all human beings, grounded either in Christianity or in secular principles of universal human rights. The attentive listener will have noticed the heterogeneity of this moral field. Of the four lines of force that structured it, the last three, attending to consequences, safeguarding free will, and affirming human equality are more conventionally labeled moral than is the first, pursuing science. I have, however, placed science deliberately and squarely within the moral field because of strong 19th century assumptions about its moral value as an enterprise fostering human progress and because contemporaries regarded certain moral traits the self-abnegation required by objectivity, the epistemological modesty required by positivism as necessary to its proper conduct. Okay, my effort to see this moral field in action includes three cases. The 1847 debate on race at the Paris Ethnological Society, a second called Chiding Gobino, which focuses on the immediate French response to the essay, and a third called Untangling Renan, about the figure whose position is the most difficult to parse. Time constraints require a schematic presentation. A more detailed text will appear in the AHR in February. The 1847 debate. During the spring of 1847, the fledgling Paris Ethnological Society held a debate on the, quote, distinctive characteristics of the white and black races and the conditions of association of these two races, unquote. One noteworthy for a freewheeling candor, suggesting that the participants regarded race as a wide open realm of investigation. 
The debate operated in a moral field animated by two lines of force, with a third making occasional appearances. First, the debate was to be conducted scientifically. Indeed, it aimed at constituting the new science of ethnology for which purpose the society had been formed. Secondly, practical consequences loomed large. The debate was to provide not only a factual account of racial difference, but also one consistent with a socio-political relationship between the races deemed morally acceptable. Third, certain speakers invoked the principle of human equality. Although the speakers repeatedly mentioned the importance of proceeding scientifically, the conception of science employed in the debate remained tacit and rudimentary. The data sought concerned the race's physical characteristics as well as their capacity for what was called civilization. Evidence regarded as dispositive came largely from the first-hand observations of travelers. In this respect, the society seemed to be adhering to a much earlier ethos of science, that of trust in the testimony of credible witnesses. However, sporadic grumbling about the doubtful accuracy of travelers' reports and about cherry-picking congenial examples from them indicated that the participants no longer found this older standard entirely compelling. At, moment, at moments when textual evidence seemed insufficiently robust, there were calls expressive of the emergent power of a new scientific ethos for giving a material basis to the debate. The resident phrenologist answered one call by promising to bring skulls from his collection. Gustav Deichtal, the secretary of the society and a San Simonian socialist, directed the debate with a firm hand, announcing the positions that would be argued and later summing up the results so as to award victory to his own position. The chief positions were represented by Victor Schelcher, the noted abolitionist campaigning to end slavery in the French colonies, Victor Corte de Lille, a lapsed San Simonian of politically conservative bent, and Deichtal himself. Schelcher's report began by boldly invoking one line of force in the moral field. Quote, I believe in the absolute equality of all the members of the great human family, he said, adding that any assertion of racial inferiority was, quote, as contrary to science, history, and ethnology as it is to reason. Proceeding to perform ethnology in the prescribed fashion, he argued that voyagers to Central Africa had found ample proof of civilization among indigenous peoples. Cultivated fields, two-story slate houses, finesse in spinning and weaving, and a degree of Arabic literacy that far surpassed the French literacy of many French peasants. Pressed by his colleagues on the primacy that his ethnology accorded the postulate of human equality, he declared that while he, quote, honored and respected science, he did not, quote, believe it infallible. Hence, he admonished his fellow savant to speak prudently on questions concerning sacred interests. The report of Corte de Lille criticized Schelcher for, quote, grafting fact onto theory and for reading the documentary record tendentiously. According to Corte, the corpus of travelers' tales traced every instance of civilization in Africa to Arab Islamic influences, leading him to conclude, contrary to Schelcher, that the black race possessed no autonomous initiative to civilize itself. 
His succinct formulation of his position was particularly repugnant. Quote, the more beautiful the racial type, the more advanced its civilization. The uglier the racial type, the more imperfect its social condition. In the first instance, we have initiative, progress, domination. In the second, impotence, subjugation, prostration, end quote. Corte conceded that equality among human beings existed in the eyes of God, but he also insisted that it nowhere exists as a fact. He sought to soften his harsh views through practical policy. His reason and conscience cried out against the conclusion that the original disparity between the races justified the oppression of a part of the human family. Instead, by dint of its superiority, the white race bore the responsibility for the tutelage of the black race. Blacks were capable of improvement, but only if raised up by paternalistic whites. Deichdahl, too, believed in the inequality of the races, and like Corte, in the blacks' lack of civilizing initiative. But for him, racial difference represented a positive resource. As a San Simonian, he held that the future associative state would arise from the dialectical tempering of reason by sentiment, as embodied in the male-female couple. Taken as an individual, the sentimental female fell short of full equality with the rational male but she had an equal functional importance in the couple. Deichdahl's ethnological position turned on the resemblance he perceived between women and blacks, an ingenious idea, Corte piped up helpfully. Both were essentially sentimental creatures and considered as individuals inferior. However, on the model of the heterosexual couple, a complementary partnership of whites and blacks would elevate the black to equal functional importance. That partnership would also strengthen the associative state, with racial difference serving as social glue. Reviewing the moral field in which the 1847 Ethnological Society debate operated, it's clear that while the axiom-driven structure of Shell Share's argument commanded no assent, most everyone agreed that ethnology was double-pronged. A tangle of fact and value, it would collect data about race and consider the data's practical implications. Some outliers wanted to confine the debate in the positive manner to the scientific terrain of facts, but this position was rare. Deichdahl selectively debarred the premise of human equality from ethnology by citing the exigencies of discipline building. It would, he said, simply annihilate a science dedicated to classifying racial difference. This extraordinary debate led swiftly to the disbanding of the Paris Ethnological Society. Once the revolutionaries of 1848 decreed the abolition of slavery in the French colonies, the society's concerns declined in urgency. But the debate had thoroughly politicized ethnology. As Paul Broca, the founder of the Paris Anthropology Society, later attested, the 1847 debates had led the public to regard ethnology, quote, not as a science, but as a cross between politics, sociology, and philanthropy. To erase this, quote, detrimental impression, 
Broca and his new discipline of anthropology would rely not on textual interpretation, but on the examination of objective material evidence, skeletons and skulls. The turn in the construction of science after 1850 was thus in the direction of rigor, purification, and self-abnegation, insofar as this turn had specific purchase on the science of race, it would encourage a deliberate bracketing of its practical consequences. I turn now to Chiding Gobineau. As a member of this company of racial theorists, Gobineau is something of an uh, anomaly, an obscure autodidact who passed as a nobleman, though lacking genealogical credentials, he worked in solitude, not frequenting savant societies. But Gobineau attached a scientific credo to his investigations of race. His prospectus for the essay depicted it as a series of, quote, deductions founded on positive results. In fact, Gobineau's essay relied on the kinds of textual sources and methods employed by the Paris Ethnological Society. And his blunt thesis of racial hierarchy resembled that of Corte de Lille. But Gobineau departed fundamentally from Corte in his refusal to believe that any socio political action could palliate the long-term toxicity of the so-called inferior races. He argued for the permanent and indelible superiority in intelligence, beauty, and capacity for civilization of the white race over the yellow and black and of the Aryan Germans over other whites. Most provocatively, Gobineau also argued that racial mixing was gradually diluting and depleting humanity's best racial stock and bringing about the inexorable decline of civilization. Gobineau flaunted this pessimism. His complaint about the decadence of his own era compared with the medieval glory of a conquering Aryan nobility was part of his carefully fashioned persona as a disgruntled, world-weary aristocrat. Apart from its perfunctory claims to scientific status, Gobineau's essay operated in no moral field. The book paraded a proud amorality. Tocqueville's stinging private letters to the author of the essay were designed to reinsert Gobineau's racially centered historical narrative in a universe where conventional moral considerations still mattered. Unlike so many of his contemporaries, Tocqueville was impervious to the siren song of science. That is, science in its positivist sense as the quest for lawful regularities in nature and the application of this method to the study of the human world. He certainly prized science in its loose French sense as knowledge, and with this meaning in mind, occasionally called for a science of politics but he deplored socio-political analyses in terms of a single causal factor, or claims that a factor like race could unlock the secrets of history by revealing historical laws. Tocqueville's moral field, as it emerged in his chiding of Gobineau, was dominated by the traditional mind-body dualism that befitted him as a non-believer who retained a deep respect for Christianity. According to this doctrine, human freedom hinged on keeping the freely willing spiritual compo component of human nature distinct from the brute materiality of the body. Materialism equaled fatalism. In reprimanding Gobineau, Tocqueville infused this bland, utterly commonplace doctrine with moral and political passion. He called the thesis of the essay pernicious, 
akin to pure materialism, assuming a fatality inherent in a certain organization of matter and implying a very great constriction, if not a complete abolition of human freedom. Especially noteworthy for our purposes, Tocqueville emphasized the practical consequences of Gobineau's theory. Agnostic about its truth claims, he turned to the question of whether Gobineau's racial philosophy of history was, quote, useful to humanity. From this pragmatic perspective, he concluded, Gobineau's position had to be rejected, for its negative consequences were legion. It would deprive peoples, quote, in barbarism, indolence, or servitude of any reason to try to improve their position. Don't you see, he asked, with rising urgency and exasperation, that from your doctrine will spontaneously issue all the evils to which permanent inequality gives birth. Arrogance, violence, scorn for one's fellows, tyranny, and every sort of abjection. The clarity of Tocqueville's moral position derived from his unfashionable refusal to recognize science as the ultimate authority on earthly matters. Less memorably than Tocqueville, others tarred Gobineau with the brush of materialism. A review of the essay for the prestigious Journal des Débats expressed moral distaste. Quote, I cannot admit that man and society are suspended from a fact of a material and purely physiological order. The broadly Cousanian inspiration for this position emerged when the reviewer observed, all of philosophy resides in its being distinct from phrenology. Cousin, famous for his distrust of new reductive natural sciences, particularly loathed phrenology which professed to explain mental life by protuberances on the brain, visible and palpable as bumps on the skull. Cousin defined his mission as retooling philosophy for the 19th century, when it had to fend off encroachments against, from science. Hence, while his anti-materialism could constitute a powerful moral argument against racial science, it came with an important downside. It was suspicious of science, failed to recognize its distinctive moral claims, and tended to discourage its development altogether. As the moral field shaped itself in the French reception of Gobineau's essay, two mutually supportive lines of force belief in the irreducibly dual nature of human beings, and concern for the practical consequences of racial theory shunted science aside. Our last case in this experiment is the hardest. Renan's moral field as a racial theorist and as the popularizer of the invidious comparison between Aryans and Semites is the most difficult to map. It expanded over time, eventually including all four of the available considerations without thereby enabling Renan to satisfy the moral requirements that he, unlike Gobineau, claimed to honor. My account here focuses on Renan's general history of the Semitic languages of 1855, though I venture backward and forward in time. Philology, the discipline in which Gobineau dabbled, comes to the fore with Renan. A poor boy, handsomely educated by the church, which he left after a crisis of conscience upon facing ordination, the young Renan was introspective and morally earnest. He also developed a love of the Hebrew language, 
while studying it at the seminary for purposes of biblical exegesis. Of all his courses he wrote in personal letters of the early 1840s, Hebrew holds the greatest charm for me. No language is more beautiful and more simple. After renouncing the church, which he faulted for clinging to defective readings of the Old Testament, Renan moved toward a secular career as a philologist. Renan embraced philology in an era when it had tremendous cachet in Europe. Not only the domain of specialists, it also gripped the general educated public. The excitement surrounding it arose from the monumental insight announced by William Jones before the Calcutta Asiatic Society in 1786, and then validated and honed by German philologists in the early 19th century that Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, and most European languages were related, part of the same language family. This discovery not only tied European culture closer to that of the so-called Orient than had previously been assumed, it also introduced a new system of categories for dividing up the world. The language family first identified by Jones was named alternately Indo-European, Indo-Germanic, or with reference to the Northern Indian nobility thought to be its original speakers, Aryan, a term, addressed, a term adopted by Renan, Gobineau, and Corte de Lille that harbored a dreadful future. As early as 1786, Jones demarcated this large group of languages from another language family, including Hebrew and Arabic, that gradually came to be known by the adjective Semitic. Let's return to the Renan of the 1850s and the susceptibility of his philological work to charges of what would later be called anti-Semitism and racism. Foremost among Renan's provocations was his assertion near the opening of the general history. Quote, I am then the first to recognize that the Semitic race compared to the Indo-European race represents an inferior combination of the elements of human nature, unquote. Renan's use of the word race should be underscored, for it points to the persistent ambiguity of his thinking. In the book's preface, he presented himself as a stickler for verbal precision, asserting that judgments about races, which he equated with blood, must be hedged round with many restrictions. Yet Renan played fast and loose with the terms. A manuscript of 1847 employed such key words as language family, nation, people, ethnological division, stock, and race interchangeably. And this tendency continued with a somewhat greater preference for race in the general history. In sum, Renan's Semitic race probably referred to a language family and a biological race simultaneously. Vacillation disappeared, however, when Renan itemized the numerous manifestations of Semitic inferiority. In his telling, the Indo-European languages had an organic fluidity that enabled their repeated rebirth, while their Semitic counterparts, which had shown no development since earliest antiquity, were metallic. True, the genius of the Semites and their vast contribution to humanity was their discovery of monotheism. But Renan cautioned his reader to put this breakthrough in perspective. It resulted not from reflection or reasoning, but from the instincts of the Semitic race. It may have even been a geographically determined reflex, 
arising from the sublime uniformity of the desert. Moreover, given the Semites' ineptitude for science and philosophy, it fell to the Indo-European race to seek to explain God and the world rationally. The Semites' laudable intuition of a single deity also perversely reinforced their inferiority in other areas. It denied them the power to generate a mythology, left them artistically barren, and rendered them intolerant, unlike the early Indo-Europeans who never took their polytheistic religions for absolute truth. Some recent commentators have tried to save Renan from himself by stressing that his philological writings treat language, an, imm an immaterial entity, rather than the materiality of race. But that argument fails to persuade. In addition to Renan's frustrating slipperiness about the relation of language to race, his concept of language is extraordinarily deterministic. He habitually used the term mold as a metaphor for the shaping power of language. Every language family, he said, emerges complete from the mold of the people's spontaneous spirit, incapable of self-correction, imprisoned in its grammar, its intellectual operations fixed. In terms of its impermeability by and fundamental exclusion from history, Renan's language family is arguably the functional equivalent of race. Certainly that is how Franck, the philosophy professor we met earlier, read the general history when he reported on it to the academy. Renan, he charged, had let the system of race dominate the book. It had passed over, uncontested, into the study of language and mental productions. He had thus fallen into a philosophical error, and you've heard this one before, by not carefully separating the two orders of existence he ended up affirming the fatalism of matter and blood, which renders man the slave of his physiology, which subordinates his will to instinct, his faculties of mind to the color and form of his face." Unquote. Like Tocqueville addressing Gobineau, Franck relied on philosophical dualism to criticize Renan's racial theory from a moral standpoint. In other contexts, for example, in 1858 appreciation of Cousin, Renan affirmed that dualism, but he did not yet introduce it into his moral field or allow it to interact with his philology. He had a stronger moral allegiance, one inimical to Cousin's philosophy, and this was science in a very nearly positivist sense. Already in 1848, Renan, who had first read Auguste Comte in the 1840s, was heaping epistemological praise on philology, calling it the exact science of the products of the human mind. The moral hold of science on Renan helps to explain why his invidious comparison of Aryans and Semites could appear blameless to him. In the conclusion of the general history, he operated in a moral field with two lines of force in play, not only the ethos of science, but also the, quote, sacred and incontestable postulate of the equality of all human beings in the eyes of God. His acceptance of the latter postulate cannot, he says, deter him from a scientific investigation of the races. Yet he feels confident that an utter separation of the two will preserve both intact. Quote, to be independent, science must not be disturbed by any dogma. By that same token, it is essential that moral and religious belief be sheltered 
from the results of science, unquote. Renan says nothing about how this double vision works in practice. He acts as if the invi invidious labeling in his empirical racial science has no worldly consequences. But critics like Franck were not so sanguine. With the express intent of responding to his critics and clarifying the thesis of the general history, Renan addressed the Paris Asiatic Society in 1859. Race, he repeated, had exercised enormous power in history, determining, for example, the Aryans' role as the leaders of human progress. But Renan now relegated the power of race to the past. He invoked the secular variant of the a priori postulate of human equality, adding it to the religious variant already present in his moral field. The abstract standard of hum universal human rights on which modern nations like France based their social order had, he said, superseded and, quote, completely eliminated the fact of race, quote, at least officially. This recognition, he implied, ought to disarm his critics. Quote, let the school that seeks the key to history in ethnography and comparative philology, that's his own school, let that school not then be accused of seeding too much to blood and misunderstanding the moral and universal side of human nature. Renan went further in the direction of minimizing the historical power of race when the practical implications of racial labels, including those he had nurtured, became the stuff of daily newspapers later in the century. The French humiliation in the Franco-Prussian War led to accusations that Alsatian Jews had betrayed the fatherland. The 1882 crash of the Union Générale, a Catholic bank, was widely attributed to the Rothschilds, provoking a burst of anti-Jewish rhetoric. In this changing political environment, Renan seems to have perceived that he had been playing with fire. Or put differently, he seems to have realized that a moral field structured by belief in human equality and sealed off from it the demands of objective scientific research about race was hobbled without a third line of force, concern for the practical consequences of racial theory. In several public lectures of the early 1880s, he deliberately reined in the concept of race, limiting its applicability. I'll mention only one of them here. What is a nation, delivered at the Sorbonne in 1882, has become the best known of Renan's texts in the 21st century. Speaking in its opening paragraph of the dangerous misunderstandings prevalent in his day, and which, though he neglects to say it, his own work helped to foster, Renan sought to correct the confusion that had prompted the equation of nation with race and the attribution of political sovereignty to ethnographic or linguistic groups. His overarching point with echoes of Kuzanian dualism, was that a nation was a radically immaterial entity, a soul or spiritual principle, resting on the desire of its members to continue their common life. It was also, in Renan's eloquent, moving, and oft-cited formulation, an everyday plebiscite. Read against the background of Renan's changing attitude about race, his lecture seems to represent a crystallization of moral consciousness and to express a hint of repentance. Yet, the lecture did not disown the race concept itself. 
and as late as 1890, two years before his death, Renan still affirmed his belief in the inequality of the human races. What then to conclude from this experiment in the empirical history of moral thinking? What advantage accrues to the historian from specifying the moral field that structured the discussion of racial theory among mid 19th century French intellectuals and then tracking some of their interventions to see that moral field in action? I would suggest that such a procedure has revealed the intellectuals in this study as simultaneously constrained and creative in their moral encounters with the category of race. The limited number of considerations available to them in the moral field of their day, as in the moral field of any day, constrained them. At the same time, they were flee free to plot their own pathways through the field, engaging with the considerations that arrested them. By approaching these intellectuals through the device of the moral field, we acquire a language to describe their moral choices from the inside out. We begin to grasp the particular logics of their moral worlds, at least with respect to racial theory. And even if our descriptions inevitably betray our own values, our account remains analytic. Blanket moral judgment is ruled out. The moral field also captures process, its navigation by individual thinkers, their gravitation to certain lines of force and indifference to others, reveals the field's inherent dynamism and continually changing shape. The dynamism derives as well from the way the lines of force affect one another when combined by thinkers in the field. The line of force that animated most of the intellectuals in this study was the ethos of science. And hence the basic plot of the story I've told concerns interactions between science and the other lines of force. The ethos of science continually provided an impetus to develop a theory of the races. The other three lines of force each offered potential resistance. They typically counseled slowing down, thinking twice, exercising caution. Given this imbalance of forces, three against one to put it crudely, it is a testament to the attractive power of science at this date, as well as to its fluid meaning, that racial theory got off the ground and continued to thrive. But the other three lines of force weren't intrinsically weak. It was when intellectuals attempted to combine them with science that their power flagged. Thus, as we've seen, the tool most ready at hand to express discomfort with racial theory was the philosophical dualism of spirit and matter. Tocqueville employed it privately to criticize Gobineau. Franck used it publicly to criticize Renan. But it came with baggage. It was suspicious of, if not hostile to science, and hence could be readily dismissed by the scientifically minded. Of the racial theorists considered here, only Renan seems to have lent it serious, if belated credence, and to judge and revise his work in its terms. Another line of force, the a priori belief in human equality, figured in much theorizing about race when adopted as a starting point for scientific research, as by Shell Share in the 1847 debate, it struck contemporaries as flagrantly at odds with scientific inquiry. When alluded to in passing by a racial theorist, as by Corte at that same debate, or even incorporated into a theory as by Renan in the conclusion to the general history, it tended to lose its teeth. 
relegated to the realm of ideal values, cordoned off from the realm of fact, it was incapable of influencing scientific work. Finally, speculating about practical consequences did not necessarily curb the excesses of racial theory. For both Corté and Deichtal in 1847, the racial inequality posited by their scientific investigations could be made tolerable through imagined forms of social engineering. Tocqueville, perhaps the only figure in this study who doubted the moral and philosophical value of the positivist human sciences, offers a stark contrast. Agnostic about the truth of Gobineau's theory, he focused on an assessment of its usefulness to humanity. His predictive capacity proved so accurate that his conjuring up of the practical effects of a theory of racial inequality constitutes for us a definitive warning. To translate Tocqueville's position into the terms of the moral field, it was his de detachment from the scientific ethos that permitted his full bore engagement with consequentialist thinking about race. I called Renan the hardest case in this experiment, and perhaps he can now be seen as my best single argument for an empirical history of moral thinking. Renan emerges in this account as an interminably equivocal figure. He was a well-intentioned young man who probably exaggerated the certitude of science in proportion to his need to replace Catholicism with a comparable moral authority. Having made an early choice to grant science dominant status in his moral field, he struggled throughout his life with the moral implications of his racial theory. He was neither incorrigible, he revised his position on race in response to criticism and the pressure of events, nor for all that quite corrigible either. Approaching Renan through the device of the moral field renders his moral itinerary as a racial theorist intelligible which is to say replete with the dilemmas, blindnesses, and structural constraints stemming from his own choices and from the limitations of the field itself. Such an approach helps us to understand, in moral terms, the unfortunate resilience of 19th century racial theory, while appropriately refraining from a blanket moral judgment of its proponents. Placing the moral life squarely within our purview, we nonetheless remain on the historian's terrain. Thank you.